This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on AFR Talk. Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. Apparently, looking at the headlines, apparently China has banned the sale of Hillary Clinton's book. By the way, her book has dropped to number 34 on the bestseller lists. The book, Blood Feud, that profiles the bitter animosity between the Clintons and the Obamas, that's riding high at number three. Hillary Clinton's doorstopper tome has dropped to number 34, and now China has offered the ultimate indignity and has has banned the sale of her book all together. Uh, all right. Um, number to call if you want to join our conversation is 888-589-8840. President Obama, let's grab clip number three. President Obama apparently is out there now even saying he's going to have to go it alone on immigration, can't get the Republicans to cooperate. They're stubborn. They're obstinate. They won't cross the aisle work with him. So he is just going to have to launch out and issue these executive orders. I mean, we were listening to a tyrant speaking. This is the way totalitarians speak. He said that with regard to the uh, Hobby Lobby decision this morning. I read you the statements from the White House and from the spokesman. Um, the White House, uh, President Obama, will consider whether the president can act on his own to mitigate the effect of the Supreme Court ruling. So he finds a Supreme Court ruling he just doesn't like, and he's just going to ignore it. He's going to act on his own. Hey, Jeff, could you uh, come in just for a quick second? Yeah. You know, Jeff, you and I were talking on the break about President Obama, who fancies himself something of a constitutional scholar. And uh, you were suggesting that uh, as a constitutional scholar, he does, in fact, believe in three branches of government. He does. He does. But it just happens to be the three branches are me, myself, and I. And we're about ready <laughs> to see that separation of powers doctrine on display this afternoon. Now, here is, is clip number three. This is President Obama, his weekly address, and he says exactly the same thing. Let's listen. The problem is Republicans in Congress keep blocking or voting down almost every serious idea to strengthen the middle class. This year alone, they've said no to raising the minimum wage, no to fair pay, no to student loan reform, no to extending unemployment insurance. And rather than invest in education that helps working families get ahead, they actually voted to give another massive tax cut to the wealthiest Americans. This obstruction keeps the system rigged for those at the top and rigged against the middle class. And as long as they insist on doing it, I'm going to keep taking actions on my own, like the actions I've already taken to tr attract new jobs, lift workers' wages, and help students pay off their loans. I intend to do my job. And if it makes Republicans in Congress mad that I'm trying to help people out, then I welcome them to join me so we can do it together. So that's uh, President Obama. The takeaway there is I will keep taking actions on my own. Now, speaking of Hillary Clinton, I want to play clips four and five, Walker, if we can get those lined up. You know, the, the, the Democrats are getting really, really nervous about Hillary Clinton because she is the queen. She is the anointed one. She is the anointed successor to Barack Obama. She's the smartest woman who ever lived. She's the smartest woman in the world. And they are wringing their hands. They are fretting. They are anxious that this book tour that she is, is on is going to torpedo her chances to be crowned to undergo a coronation in 2016. So here's Andrea Mitchell talking about Hillary Clinton's problems on this book tour. Not a candidate, but the book tour has looked like a political campaign. I think it's a little bit that she was rusty, and it's a little bit of lack of self-awareness when she talks about being dead broke, and she then tried to fix it, but still not getting the language, you know, politically correct, if you will, to really understand that she is a little bit out of touch, despite all of her work and all of her connection to hardworking people in the middle class. She doesn't quite realize that, as Ruth Marcus wrote in the Washington Post, she should stop giving paid speeches. She should stop asking colleges to pay even yeah. out of a foundation. She's got enough money. Just let it go. But part of this, this is that. <laughs> so, you know, and, and the latest dust up, I think, I don't know, is it Rice University? Someplace she's going, she's going to get paid two hundred and twenty-five grand 
to give this graduation speech. And the students are saying, look, our tuition is going through the roof and you're paying a woman that's worth $100 million, 225 grand to give a commencement speech. They are outraged. And here's Andrew Mitchell saying, hey, maybe it's time to cut out the paid speeches. Maybe it's time to admit you've made enough money. Remember, President Obama said that at one point. You know, at some point you've made enough money. And so all these liberals, now they care about Hillary. They want her to be the next president. That's why they're they're anxious. They have this kind of maternal protective instinct. They want to protect her chances to become the next president. And they realize that she's out there making, <laughs> making her road ahead, uh, you know, just increasing the odds every single day she's out there, every stop she makes. Every time she talks, every time she opens her mouth, uh, she says something that's going to make it more difficult for her to win in 2016. And Andrew Mitchell's making as many excuses for her as she can. She's rusty. Uh, she's a little bit out of touch. And maybe she should just stop giving uh, paid speeches. Now, here's Bill Maher, clip number five. And Bill Maher, I mean, he wants Hillary Clinton to be crowned in 2016. He's got some advice. Let's talk about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, she's in a bit of a mess because a couple of weeks ago she said that when she and Bill left the White House, they were two broke girls. <laughs> she did. She said, we came out of the White House not only dead broke, but in debt. We had no money when we got here. We struggled to piece the other resources for mortgages, for houses, for Chelsea education. It was not easy. And so true. When you emerge from the financial rut, that is, the U.S. presidency, <laughs> Talk about a red flag on a resume. When they see that, that you ran the world for eight years, nobody will hire you. Uh, so they're trying to keep walking this back. And, uh, you know, people say that, well, Hillary being out there with her book tour, talking about all this stuff, it's going to inoculate her. Mm. You know what? There's a fine line between inoculate and we're sick of you. My advice to Hillary, just go away. Go away for a while. We're going to see each other in a couple of years, a lot. Just go away, because otherwise you're going to blow this. All right, so liberals all across the fruited plain, Andrea Mitchell, stop giving paid speeches. Bill Meyer, just disappear. You're blowing the, whatever chance you had to be our next president. We can drop down and get one more clip, uh, Walker. Let's drop down to clip number 11, the Chuck Todd clip, if you can um, grab that one. Uh, uh, Chuck Todd, NBC, talking about how the Clintons got all their money. Remember, they got $100 million, uh, dollars, and, and Hillary Clinton's been out there talking over and over again about how we had to do it the old-fashioned way. We had to do it by the dint of hard work. We had to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, and we just so disciplined and so dedicated, and we've got such a fantastic work ethic that we climbed out of the hole and became rich. Here's what Chuck Todd had to say about all of that. And let's remember how they acquired their wealth. They didn't do it in some incredible business, creating jobs and all this. They just acquired from the Clintons. Right. Okay, I mean, it, you know, the, why is he earning $100 million? Because people want to hear Bill Clinton speak. It, look, he worked very hard in public service to build a track record to make him uh, attractive to donors. But this is not like shoveling coal. This is not like building a factory. And so there is that aspect, too. It's not like they've acquired their wealth from hard work. <laughs> they have not acquired their wealth from hard work, they acquired wealth for being the Clintons. That's Chuck Todd. He's in their corner. They acquire, acquired wealth for being the Clintons. It's like he's saying they're the Kardashians. I mean, what have what have any of the Kardashians ever done? And they're wealthy. I don't know how much money they have. They've got a lot of money. They've just gotten rich from being the Kardashians, not from actually doing anything. And the same thing here is what Chuck Todd is saying is true about the Clintons. Now, I want, to, uh, I want to turn back to this Chris McDaniel race. The number to call if you want to join our conversation is 888-589-8840, 888 And let me grab one call before we go back to the McDaniel race. Let's go to David in uh, Arizona, if we can grab David in Arizona. Welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. David, what's on your mind? Hi, Brian. I'm just really excited about this Hobby Lobby decision. What a what a great victory, and it just goes to show you what you've been saying along is, is right. Uh, we're fighting a winnable war. It's like uh, eating an elephant. You just have to do it one bite at a time. But I wanted to touch on the, the guy that called uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, just want to tell my story. When I was a young man, my wife and I, um, we used the birth control. It was the IUD, and the way this thing works is it actually scrubs the fertilized egg off of the uterus and it's like an automatic abortion tool and mm -hmm. i had no 
and I was young and, and truly ignorant and, and what got me thinking about this is I lost my daughter in a car wreck about 10 years ago and oh, I was wow. thinking, man, I wish I'd have had more kids. Mm -hmm. and then I got to thinking about this and, you know, I could have an entire herd of kids in heaven and, and I am remorseful over it, but I, I truly didn't know what I was doing at the time. And, and I'd just like to encourage the ladies and men out there who have been involved in, in an abortion like David said, his baby can't be with him, but he can go and be with his baby. And and someday, if they put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they can be with their baby. And and don't let the devil beat you up over this over and over and ruin your life. Learn from it and go on. I, I just wanted to say that. All right, David, that's a tremendous word. What an encouraging word. And, you know, I know women that have been through this a program called Surrendering the Secret, where they come to terms with abortions that they've had when they were younger, and a lot of times they didn't know any better. They were young. They were desperate. They were alone. They didn't have mature friends, didn't have mature counsel around them, and they're desperate to try to solve this urgent problem that has popped up in their uh, their lives. And so they'll make a horribly tragic mistake, one that they live to regret, basically, for the rest of their lives. But in this uh, curriculum, and it doesn't have to involve this particular curriculum, but the point is by coming to terms with it, and by bringing that secret, by surrendering it, bringing it out, and sharing it with a, with a, a, a trusted friends, and by openly acknowledging that sin uh, to God, they can receive forgiveness. They can be cleansed. They can be renewed. They can be comforted by God. They can be restored. And then one of the parts that's so healing in that process is, is they begin to understand that they will see that child one day. Not that that excuses what they did, but this is another part of God's grace and his mercy to bring something wonderful and precious out of pain, out of tragedy, even out of sin, that there is the day coming when uh, the, the women will be reunited with their children. And, um, you know, in one of the parts of this curriculum, Surrendering the Secret, the women are actually asked or encouraged to ask God to reveal to them the name of that child, the child that's now in heaven. Uh, with God, and God will be gracious to them and reveal to them the name of this child, and so they can commemorate the life of that child uh, in some way and anticipate the day when they will uh, be able to see it. It can be a tremendous comfort for women that have had miscarriages uh, because this happens to, to women where they, uh, through no fault of their own at all, their bodies don't sustain the pregnancy, and it could happen a number of times. And so they have the prospect through their pain and tears of knowing that they will have children in the age to come to look forward to. Focal Point AFR Talk will be right back. The following is not an actor, but a real-life story from Trinity Debt Management. When our daughter 